Well, welcome to this next session in which we're going to explore the Trinity. So I want to welcome both our studio audience, but also those that are watching uh, on our streaming uh, network. We hope you find this edifying because we're going to explore one of the most mysterious concepts in the scripture. And uh, indeed, metaphors reign where mysteries reside. We sometimes hide the fact that we don't really know about something by giving it a fancy label. And nowhere is that more evident than we start talking about the Trinity. And uh, so we want to explore this a little bit. Is there one God or three? That's a debate among many, many people. How does one uh, reconcile the one God of the Shema with the three persons of the New Testament Trinity? And what does God reveal to us of himself in his word? And that's our reference here, it isn't traditions or other people's view. We're going to see what the Bible really has to say. The doctrine of the Trinity has been at the heart of a lot of theological controversy. And uh, that um, the routine objection is that the doctrine sacrifices monotheism for tritheism. But uh, this is all based on a misconception. And uh, so we'll just jump right on in and see what we can find out about this. How does one deal with the ostensible tensions between the Old and New Testament revelations of the ultimate mystery of the Godhead. And so many of us contrive conceptual models to somehow try to deal with this. And that's one reason we have so much misunderstanding because we rely on models. Uh, power, intellect, will is one attempt. Body, soul, and spirit is another attempt. Uh, these are all models, if you will, motion, light, heat, like the sun, for example. Uh, the three tones in a chord of music. These are all suggestions that have been advanced to try to deal with this. A single ray of light, but composed of three primary colors. Uh, this water uh, being solid, liquid, or gas, if you will. In mathematics, we have things called an infinite series. And you can have th three infinite series that add up still to one infinite series, and so forth. And then you can get into hyperspaces and Hilbert spaces, and so forth. And so... My favorite for many years is simply that of a corporation consisting of three perfectly communicating partner shareholders. That's one model. But all of these, I think, are dangerous because they can darken counsel, if you will, by misleading analogies. And so let's stand back for a minute. How would you communicate to an aborigine a TV set that's never seen one? How would you explain to an aborigine the Internet? Or how would you explain a 747 jet? No matter what, how you might try to communicate these to someone that's not in our culture, any explanation would be inherently incomplete, of course. One of the things we're encountering as we get into this topic is that we're crossing the very boundaries of our physical reality. And uh, so even if we're just dealing with physical properties, they're beyond the boundaries of our reality itself. As we have many materials on this that I invite you to take a look at that will uh, illuminate that dimension of all of this. And see, when we talk about the Godhead, that we're dealing with something even one step beyond uh, even the metacosm of the, of, of, the, of the physical reality. And so it can only be known by revelation, uh, not by reason alone. And uh, we only know what God has chosen to reveal to us. So let's explore that. And uh, now there really is no absurdity with the Trinity when you realize that plurality can and does coexist with unity. You can have that something that's unified and yet still be composed of sub-pieces to that. Example is Adam and Eve. In the scripture, they are referred to as one flesh. They're obviously distinct and separate, and yet they also uh, are dealt with as one flesh. And so... I want to again underscore a caveat that we want to put forth as we explore these doctrines, essential doctrines of the end times. We're not here to sell a particular point of view. We'll explain what we believe and why we believe it, but our goal is for you to become a self-feeder, to determine your own view from your own study of the scriptures. That's our goal. Our aim is simply to be helpful as you undertake a heuristic search, heuristic being serving to discover for yourselves. And uh, we rely very heavily here on hermeneutics, not doctrines, your theory of interpretation. 
we espouse a very, very high hermeneutic, taking the Bible very, very seriously, very, very precisely. So, now, one place to start is, of course, with the most cherished portion of Scripture to the Jewish reader, the Shema, as they call it. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And you recognize this, of course. This is what Jesus himself quotes as the great commandment. He's basically quoting the Shema. Jesus said to him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. So that's just the Lord himself uh, quoting the Jewish Shema. When you go into a Jewish dwelling, you'll find a mezuzah on the, on the threshold. And that not always, but typically has the Shema. It has, it has some scripture. It's usually the Shema in there. And of course, in, in, in Exodus 20, Ten Commandments, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. That echoes the same idea there. You go to Isaiah 45, you find the same expression, where God says, I am the Lord, there is none else. There is no God beside me. I girded thee, though thou hast not known me, that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. I am the Lord, and there is none else. And these are, of course, all advanced in the area of what we call monotheism. One. One explore this term. One. There are several Hebrew words for one. Uh, Yahid is unique. And Echad, which, uh, which incidentally does not preclude distinguishable entities within it. And the Genesis 2.24 being an example, Adam and Eve are said to be one flesh. The word there is Echad. And uh, in Deuteronomy, of course, uh, the Shema uses that word Echad which means unified, unity in a sense. And within linguistic structure, the fact that unity or oneness is expressed in God does not exclude having plurality within it. Just like you can have one corporation of three partners, that's one of the reasons I have had a tendency to look at it in those, in those terms. At the same time, there's a concept of plurality. One of the words, Genesis 1 opens up, Barashit bara Elohim. The word Elohim, most of you recognize, even not knowing Hebrew, you recognize that a masculine noun with an I am ending is a plural. Elohim is a plural noun, as in cherubim, seraphim, and so forth. The I am ending is a plural. Elohim is a plural word. Now, what's strange about this is, and by the way, the same, uh, Adonai is also a, an example of that. Now, it's interesting that the very first verse has a grammatical error in it. Because Elohim is a plural noun, but it's used with a singular verb, bara. In the beginning, God created the earth. Well, the, uh, the Elohim is plural. How many of you knew that? I see a show of hands. Most of you have. Did you know that in Hebrew, a plural is three or more? And uh, so it's, they have a concept of a dual as well as a plural. And so Elohim is a plural. And uh, so, uh, and incidentally, this is also used by Paul uh, in 1 Thessalonians 3 in the Greek. He plays on this. Every place where Elohim is written in the Bible, it is technically an error. The noun doesn't agree with the verb. We're given a subtle clue here that there's more than one within the one. That's really what's implied here. And so... And we notice this shows up even in the English translations. If you look at Genesis 1, verse 26, and God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and so forth. It's interesting that the word us, that, that plurality, shows up even in the translation. And uh, our image, our likeness. You see the plural involved there. And to get down to Genesis 3, verse 22, And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of what? Us. One of us. To know good and evil. And now let's put, put forth his hand and so forth. And he goes on. And so, and this can't be associated with angels because they were not associated with God in the creation. And so, you get to Genesis 11. We see it again. It says, Go to, let us go down and there confound their language. You remember that in, in, in Babel there. And uh, there again, we see that plural emerge even in the translated text. When we encounter a vision of the throne of God in Isaiah 6, 
we have the scene there, the holy place of the holy ones, celebrated by the seraphim who veiled their faces. And what do they say? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. There's this trilogy, again, suggested, but it gets even deeper than that. I want you to notice there's three declarations, obviously. And we see the same thing occur in the vision in Revelation chapter 4. We have that triplet, triplex, if you will. Here in Isaiah 6, when you get to verse 8, we also see a hint of the plural because it says, who shall go for us? Again, we have that plurality indicated. But there's something else here. It makes reference to the Lord of hosts. And uh, all sources, commentary sources, acknowledge its ac applicability to the Father. Yet, it's provocative to notice that John attributes that passage to Christ himself in John 12, verse 41, and Paul attributes that passage to the Holy Spirit in Acts 28. So we're seeing an interplay of the linguist, linguists here. All three persons are here included. Most of you are familiar with the Old Testament benedictions. Many Christian churches use it, the closing service and so forth. And uh, uh, the Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. And that's quoted from the closing verses of Numbers chapter 6. It's interesting that these three f passages can be uh, ascribed to the Father of mercies and fountain of all good in the first case, the redeeming and reconciling grace of our Lord Jesus Christ in the second case, and the purity, consolation, and joy by the communion of the Holy Spirit in the third case. And so that's one reason it's comfortable in a, in, a, in a New Testament church to use the Old Testament benediction. And so it's interesting that the three primary, pri there are many names for God in the Bible, but the three primary ones, Elohim and the Tetragrammaton, yod heh vav -Heh, most rabbis just pronounce the letters rather than try to pronounce the word, Elohim, yod heh vav -Heh, and Adonai. Each of those are ascribed to all three members of the Trinity. The Father, of course, is obvious. The Son in Isaiah 9, 6, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And that's not a synonym, by the way. We'll take on that a little later. All the way through, we find that, that we have. And yet, at the same time, in Isaiah 11, we have these terms applied to the Holy Spirit. So, interestingly enough, those names for God are ascribed in various places to the various persons of the Trinity, interestingly enough. Notice that these are all Old Testament references I'm using so far. One of the most provocative passages in this, on this topic turned out to be the second psalm. And I challenge you to read the second psalm and try to figure out who's talking to whom. And you'll quickly discover it's a trilogue among the Godhead itself. The question is raised, why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. Really? So you've got the speaker, probably the Holy Spirit, and you have these other two members there saying, let us break their bands, this is what they're quoting the people saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. And I love this. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then he shall, shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. And he continues here. I will declare the decree the Lord hath said unto me. Here's the son quoting the father. Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron, thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. And that rod of iron is a, an identity piece all through the scripture. There's a dozen places you can chase those down. Be wise now therefore, O ye kings. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and ye perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. And the word kiss there, the translation ascribes homage, if you will, that you, and so forth. And uh, we could get into the linguistics. But anyway, I challenge you to take a look at Psalm 2 and decide yourself who's speaking to who. And you'll quickly discover it's a discussion among the Trinity itself. But I have another approach that when I first discovered this some time ago, it really made, it helped me a great deal. And that's to look at the works of God, the major works of God. And notice how they're ascribed. 
Each one of these works is declared to be wrought wholly and independently by each person of the Trinity. What do I mean by that? Well, let's start with the creation of the universe. It's ascribed to the Father in Psalm 102, verse 25. It's ascribed to the Son in Colossians 1, 16 and John 1 and, and verses 1 to 3. We'll look at that a little later. To the Spirit in Genesis 1, 2, the Spirit moved. The very second verse of the book of Genesis ascribes the creation to the Holy Spirit, interestingly enough. And these are each specific ascriptions, if you will. And all three are gathered in the term of Elohim in Genesis chapter 1, interestingly enough. Let's take another one. The creation of man is ascribed to the Father in Genesis chapter 2, to the Son in Colossians 1, and to the Spirit in Job 33. Okay, and they're in plurals in Ecclesiastes and Isaiah 54. The third one we'll take a look at is the incarnation. Boy, we're going to talk a lot about that in the next session too. It's ascribed to the Father in Hebrews 10. It's ascribed to the Son in Philippians 2 and to the Spirit in Luke chapter 1, the Incarnation. And uh, the Spirit generates the Son, but in such a manner that the Son ever addresses the first person as Father. There's one exception to that. There's only one time in eternity, past or in eternity future, that Jesus doesn't call him Father. And that's when he says, my God. And he declares that when he is wearing our shoes, so to speak, as I think most of you are familiar. Well, let's take the fourth one, the life and ministry of Christ. The Son always did the will of the Father, and, he, and to this end the Spirit was given to the Son without measure. You can track that down on yourself. The death of Christ, now this is an interesting one, ascribed to the Father in Psalm 22 and Romans 8 and John 3.16, to the Son in John 10 and Galatians 2, and to the Spirit in Hebrews 9. Specifically, the death of Christ, ascribed to each member specifically. The atonement, boy, to the Father in Isaiah 53, to the Son in Ephesians 5, and to the Spirit in Hebrews 9. Each one of these you can track down and confirm to your own satisfaction. The resurrection of Christ, ascribed to the Father in Acts 2 and Romans 6, ascribed to the Son in John 10 and John 2 and to the Spirit in 1 Peter 3 and Romans 8. The resurrection of Christ. The resurrection of all mankind. This is a different event. Ascribed to the Father in John 5, also to the Son in John 5, and to the Spirit in Romans 8. We get to the inspiration of the Scriptures. Here's a verse that we all know. 2 Timothy 3.16. Ascribed to the Father in the one case, but to the Son in 1 Peter 1, and to the Spirit in 2 Peter 1. Interestingly enough. We have the minister's authority, ascribed to the Father in 2 Corinthians 3, to the Son in 1 Timothy 1, and the Spirit in Acts 20. And then we have the indwelling presence. Now this may surprise you. Your indwelling presence is ascribed to the Father in Ephesians 4, verse 6, to the Son in Colossians 1, 27, and to the Spirit in 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Now that one doesn't surprise us, but the others may surprise you that the Father and the Son indwell you, not just the Holy Spirit. We so glibly speak because it's the uh, Holy Spirit. No, all three are ascribed specifically. The very work of sanctification is ascribed to the, to the Father in the opening verse of Jude, in Hebrews chapter 2, and the Son in 1 Corinthians 6. Now this is a dandy. In fact, if, of all the doctrines, it's the one that I think we want to certainly focus on, and that's the believer's safekeeping. Ascribed to the Father in John 10, verse 29, but in, to the Son in John 10, 28, and also uh, Romans 8, 34, four different ways, and then the Spirit in Ephesians 4. Now this is one of the dozen we've looked at that we regard as an essential. We're talking about what are essentials for the end times. This is a doctrine. Uh, it's strange that we would single one out to be essential. This is certainly one of them. Uh, because then you don't know, if you're not confident of your own situation, you're, no, you're not going to be much of a witness to others. And then we have a whole bunch of others we could list, uh, uh, comparing 1 Corinthians 1 with Psalm 8, and the Logos of John 1, and so forth. There's a bunch of those. We'll go a little different way. Let's talk now not these specific events or works of God. Let's talk about the attributes of God. And uh, all these attributes are ascribed to each of the three of the Trinity. And uh, 
the eternal existence of God, ascribed to the Father in Psalm 90, verse 2, to the Son, the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, in Revelation 1, 8, and John 1, and on and on. And uh, in the Hebrew, of course, uh, Genesis 1, 1, and Isaiah 41, and so forth. I'll come back to that in another way in a little bit. And, of course, in, it's the, the, the Spirit as eternal in, the, in the Hebrews 9, verse 14. The concept of infinite power is ascribed to the Father in 1 Peter 1, 5, to the Son in 2 Corinthians 12, and the Spirit in Romans 15. Omniscience, God knows everything, something God can't do, He can't learn, <laughs> okay? Ascribed to the Father in Jeremiah 17, to the Son in Revelation 2, and to the Spirit in 1 Corinthians 2. And what about omnipresence? God is everywhere. He's not localized. The Father, uh, we have, uh, ascribed to the Father in Jeremiah 23, the Son in Matthew 18, and, and uh, to the Spirit in Psalm 139. And uh, the concept of holiness, Revelation 15.4, to the Father, to the Son in Acts 3.14, and to the Spirit everywhere. That's why we call Him the Holy Spirit. That description is very specific in its own sense. And that's one of the reasons in the vision of the throne of God in Isaiah 6, it's holy, holy, holy. It speaks for itself. The concept of truth is ascribed to the Father in John 7, to the Son in Revelation 3, 7, and it's to the Spirit in 1 John 5, 6. Now, benevolence is ascribed to the Father in Romans 2, to the Son in Ephesians 5, and the Spirit in Nehemiah Nine. So each one of those, I encourage you to chase down yourself, make your own annotations there. The dispositions for communion of the Father in 1 John 1, 3, to the John in the same verse, and also the Spirit in 2 Corinthians 13, 14. The individual distinctives, let's take all three of these and notice that they are equal in nature, they are separate in person, and they are subservient in duties. And again, I remind you that the plural of Elohim is a threefold plurality, not a dual. It's a, a threefold plurality in the Hebrew. And so there's no intimation that any one person of the Godhead sustains these attributes in respect to the other two persons or that they are held in partnership. Each is predicated of each as though none others existed. And so we want to understand that as we go here. I like the way... Uh, Lewis Perry Schaefer summarizes this. That's why I've accepted it here. The fact that each person possesses all the divine characteristics and so completely that it would seem that no other need to possess them speaks of the distinction between the persons as such. On the other hand, the fact that they all manifest these characteristics in identically the same ways and to the same measure speaks of the unity from which their mode of existence springs. And I don't know how to improve on that. That's pretty crisp, okay? So now let's, let's focus on one specific member of the three. And we'll open up with the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, the same was in the beginning with God. And how often we read that, it sounds like double talk, doesn't it? No, each is quite distinctive. In the beginning and before time. And we now know that time itself is a physical property. It varies with mass, acceleration, and gravity, among other things. God is outside our time domain. And so, before the world was created, the word already existed, is what the Greek uh, really represents here in, in the original. And uh, so, in the beginning was the word, the logos, if you will. That's a title. That's more than just a lexicographical word, like a, in a list or something. It's a, it's a principal thought or concept, the word itself. What a fascinating title of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's the, he's the expression, the utterance of that thought. And uh, the Word was with God. This conveys a sense of reciprocity. That is, the Word is not merely in the presence of God, but there existed a mutual and reciprocal relationship between the Word and God. It was with God. And uh, there's a mutual fellowship and intercommunication, a close personal relationship is the implication here. And we see that in Genesis 1.1, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. But here we have Elohim. God created the heaven and the earth. And we have this very pe peculiar term for God, which is plural in the Hebrew, which requires three, interestingly enough, by the rules of Hebrew. 
But getting back to this, it, the, the world was, 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 was. That in the Greek is an imperfect verb. It implies continuous existence. That in, in, in contrast to coming into being. It implies a continuity from, uh, from earlier. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The same was in the beginning of God. All things, wow, here we go. All things were made by Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. That's quite a statement. Jesus Christ is the Creator Himself. We need to understand that. And uh, we're going to explore that in Colossians 1.16 too in a minute here. But let's take Hebrews 1 as another uh, rendering of all of this. God who in sundry times and divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom he made the worlds, who being in the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Wow. Well, let's get back to Colossians 1.15. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? Now, the image of the invisible God, see, that's in contrast to the Gnostics and the Muslims, by the way, who maintain that God can never be known or understood. In contrast to that view, we have one who has made God known to us. That's a staggering difference to really understand. The Muslim God is somebody you cannot understand. He's capricious. He can do anything. Mean that, that means he's untrustworthy. No, no. The God of the Abram, Isaac, and Yaakov is a God who d delights in making and keeping his promises. He's antithetical to the presentation of not only the Muslims, but of course the Gnostics that, that, that Paul was writing about here. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. That's, that's in contrast. In other words, he is, made, he is, he is revealed to be understood. And... Uh, and it's because man bears the image of his creator that it was possible for the Son of God to become incarnate as man and in his humanity display the glory of the invisible God. It's an echo. That's a reflexive aspect many people don't think about. That we were creating God's image that made it possible for God to assume our image to communicate himself to us. Wow. You know, it's interesting that one of the staggering things we're going to encounter in this procession, of course, is that the Creator Himself became God and dwelt among us and uh, to try to absorb that. But as we mature in our understanding of biblical things, we begin to realize the gulf that exists between sinful man and a holy God. The more astonishing discovery isn't just that God became man. The astonishing thing is that as we meet here uh, today, there is a man sitting on the throne of God. That is every bit as staggering to realize. Jesus didn't become a man for three and a half years. He's a man to this day. We'll talk more about that as we go here. Who is the image of the invisible God uh, and the uh, and so it reflects on the Adam Christ topology that is drawn all through the scripture in which Christ is viewed as the first true man who fulfills God's design and creation. That's why we speak, one of the titles that Paul uses of Jesus is the last Adam. Adam was the first. This is the climactic one at the end. And uh, to, be man, to be in the image of Christ is the goal of all Christians. You become like the gods you worship. That's something important to really understand. Is the world unforgiving, cold? If you worship the world, you'll become cold and unforgiving. And we could go on through all the different idols. That's why it's so important to worship Christ, because then you'll become like him. Okay. See, Paul uses the word image, means an exact representation and revelation. And the writer to Hebrews affirms that Jesus Christ is the express image of his person. Jesus was able to say a, a shocking thing. He says, He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. Wow. See, in his essence, 
God is invisible, but Jesus Christ has revealed him to us in John 1.18 and elsewhere, all through. Getting back to Colossians 1.15, who is the image of the visible God, the firstborn of every creature. The firstborn. Now that's a misunderstood word. We tend that in the translation, um, the, uh, uh, in Psalm 8, uh, uh, 89, verse 27, I will make him my firstborn higher than the kings of the earth. No, it's a, it's a, it's a phrase of position. Uh, Prototokos, it's a, a priority of position, not origin. We tend to infer that's a, a, a term of origin. No, it's a term of position. The firstborn of all creation, in other words, prior to all creation, is what it really conveys in the letter to Laodicea and so forth. And it was interpreted by Arians to mean the first of a kind. And, uh, but that, it, it can have that meaning, but that meaning is not consistent with Paul's theme, which stresses the messianic priority and primacy. The word firstborn is intended to be positional. He's the heir and preeminent one, not necessarily one born first. Ishmael and Isaac are examples. Esau and Jacob, Reuben and Joseph, Manasseh and Ephraim. These are all where the firstborn isn't the firstborn in position, if you will. The first Adam, the last Adam is another example. Preexistent, only begotten. Isaac is so called in, in Hebrews 11. Abraham was, uh, Isaac was Abraham's only begotten son is a strange term. But see, it's a positional term. It's not a, uh, an order of, uh, it, it doesn't mean what some of us jump to the conclusion. Let's look at Exodus 4. And God says, And thou shalt say to Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord, uh, Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. And I say unto thee, Let my son go, that he may serve me. And if thou refu refuse to let him go, behold, I will slay thy son, even thy firstborn. Again, it's a positional term. In Psalm 89, we see that I have found David my servant with my holy oil, have I anointed him, with whom my hand shall be, uh, shall be established, mine arm also shall strengthen him, the enemy shall not exact upon him, nor the son of wickedness afflicts him, and I will beat down his foes before his face, and plague the, them that hate him, but, but my faithfulness and mercy shall be with him, in thy name shall his horn be exalted, I will set his hand also upon the sea, and his right hand in the rivers, he shall cry unto me, Thou art my Father, my God, and my rock of, the rock of my salvation, and I will make him my firstborn, higher than the kings of the earth. See there it again, it's a, it's a title of position, not origin, that's, that's, that causes a lot of linguistic confusion. My mercy will I keep for him evermore, and my covenant shall stand fast with him, and his seed also will I make to endure forever, and his throne as the days of heaven, and so on. Psalm 89, very important psalm. Let's get back to our basic text, Colossians 1. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. All things, not most things, all things. That includes Satan. That's bad news for the Mormons. No, he's not Christ's brother. Quite the contrary. He's a created thing. And uh, so, whatever cosmic powers there may be, they have nothing to offer or deny a Christian. In Christ, he has all these things. Romans 8, we'll take a look at that before we're all through in Ephesians 1. And uh, so, visible and invisible. Two different categories here. Two different kinds. We know there are four dimensions that we can directly experience. Three spatial dimensions in time, a physical property. There are, we know that there are at least six that exist but are only inferable. For a total of ten is a common estimate. Some say eleven, but that's another, but somebody else's debate. Whether there be thrones, dominions, principalities, or powers. Now those are translations of Greek, Greek terms that represent angelic beings. These are hierarchies of angels, if you will. Thrones, dominions, it, it, it doesn't ring that way in our vocabulary, but that's the Greek intention of the terms there. And all things were created by him and for him. What a statement. What a statement. Three prepositions, by, for, through, are used to refute the philosophy of false teachers. He is the heir of all things. We are all house guests in somebody else's universe. His. History is headed somewhere, and we all have an accountability for that. That's the scary part of all of this. And so, and disbelief or denial is not a refuge. We all have an appointment with destiny. That's one reason why these issues emerge to be paramount as we move into the end times. 
And it doesn't take a genius to figure out that we're heading into a period called the end times. We're not setting dates, don't misunderstand me. But clearly, these, as we move into this period of time, these issues get intensified. They get underscored. It affects our priorities. And uh, we could go on and on about that. You know, it's interesting, for centuries, the Greek philosophers taught that everything needed a primary cause, an instrumental cause, and a final cause. That was their concept. Well, the primary cause is the plan, the instrumental cause is the power, and the final cause, the purpose. When it comes to creation, Jesus Christ is the primary cause. He planned it. He's the instrumental cause. He produced it. And the final clause, he did it for his own pleasure, interestingly enough. Colossians goes on in verse 17, it says, He is before all things, and by him all things consist. And that's a strange term, consist. Synesteme. To be compacted together, to cohere, to be constituted with, to be held together. All things are held together would be perhaps a better translation there. You see, most of us understand there, if you have any physics at all, you know there's four basic forces. and There's gravity, which keeps our feet on the ground and keeps the Earth in orbit and what have you. Electromagnetic, like radio waves, light, and molecules of chemistry and so forth. The strong, then two nuclear forces. A strong nuclear force that holds the atom together. A weak nuclear force that generates radioactivity and the heat of the sun and that sort of thing, presumably. Well, the nucleus of every atom is held together by what physicists call the weak and the strong forces. The nucleus of the atom contains positively charged and neutral particles, to use a simplistic model. Notice that the nucleus is, consists of neutral and positive uh, uh, charges. The mutual electrostatic repulsion between positrons should drive the nucleus apart if it were not for the strong nuclear force which binds the nucleus together. In other words, you all know that positive and negative charges attract each other. No surprise. Two, two uh, uh, particles of the same kind, either positive or negative, repel each other. We're together? Okay, so we have a nucleus of an atom that consists of all positive things surrounded by uh, energy levels of electrons. But everything in the center of this is, should be flying apart because they're positive charges that repel each other. That's being held together. What happens when that isn't held together? Well, you know what happens. That releases energy that's unimaginable. Now, they've discovered that the zero-point energy is an active force imposed upon the universe which actively holds the very atoms of the material world together moment by moment, day by day, century by century. Similarly, accelerated electrons circling the nucleus would quickly radiate all their energy away and fall into the nucleus unless there exists an invisible energy source to counteract this. And that's what they call the zero-point energy. And it's the energy, if you will, of what we think of as empty space. It's not empty space. It has impedance. It has a whole bunch of properties that are measurable. And that's exactly what the Bible says, but that's a whole other study. But we, the atoms appear to behave in perpetual motion machines, picking up energy from the background, zero-point energy, and are thus sustained by it. And that, that's been estimated by experts to be enormously high levels of energy. Other New Testament passages deal with the density of the atomic engine physics. Hebrews 1 and 2 Peter 3 deals with these issues, interestingly enough. And uh, take a quick look at it. In Hebrews chapter 1, Hath in these days spoken to unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom he made the worlds. And uh, the, world, the word worlds there, Ionis, is plural. It means time domains, interestingly enough. And some Bibles say ages, but it's generally regarded to mean the entire creation. But, and Jesus, of course, is the creator itself. But you get to the next verse. Who being in the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had himself purged our sins and sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. The express image of his person. And there again, it's the, it's, it's the express character, like a steel engraving, if you will. And uh, all the prophets and all the writings up till now have all been but shadows and hints at the aspects of Jesus Christ. But he's the embodiment of them. And he walked this earth that we might know. Upholding all things by what? The word of his power. And there is a day he's going to say enough already. 
And this all uh, enumerates the same three facts in the same order as here. The word for upholding is the very same word as in the Septuagint is used when it speaks of the Spirit of God moving on the face of the waters in the second verse of Genesis. He brooded, he moved, and, and so forth. And he had by himself purged our sins, and that is what we had in, so eloquently expressed in uh, Ron Madsen's presentations. The Greek aorist participle is here completed. It is done. It is finished, as Jesus himself declared from the cross, to tell us die, paid in full. Well, Hebrews points out that the Son is the final revealer. He's the heir of all things. He's the Son. Through the Son, the ages were made. He's the brightness of God's glory. He's the image of the Father. He upholds all things by his power. He made purification of sin. This is the one that we're dealing with. And he sat down on majesty on high. Praise God. Let's shift and see what Peter has to say about all of this. He says, whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. The Noah, the, in Noah's day, of course. But the heavens and the earth, which are now, by the same word kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and the perdition of ungodly men. Whoop, by, not by water. God made a promise to Noah, not by water. But you want to read the small print. <laughs> Next time it's by fire, is the point. Next time by fire. And that's also all through the Old Testament. You'll find at least four places where that's alluded to. By him were all the very elements held together. And that's when he's going to let go, if you will. God's sovereignty over time. Job 22 deals with that. God has a perspective and intensity and priority that we lack. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us. We're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And uh, not willing that any should perish. You know, the astonishing thing of this entire drama is that God doesn't get what he wants. It's another refutation of Calvin. The great tragedy is that after the entire panorama of redemption, God doesn't get what he wants out of the deal. Not all will repent. That's God's preference. Staggering to realize out of the whole deal, he shortchanged in a sense of speaking. Wow. Time is our most inelastic and thus the most precious commodity we have. The scripture tells us to number our nanoseconds, right? Okay. But Peter continues, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with a fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. The day of the Lord. And uh, there's lots, of, you can make a whole study of that on your own. And it's interesting how Paul in 1 Thessalonians points out that he will come as a thief in the night to those who are in darkness, but you are the day, not in the darkness. Many people need to reread 1 Thessalonians 5 more carefully. He comes as a thief in the night to those that aren't anticipating him. In Isaiah, he says, I behold, I create a new heavens and a new earth. That's not a revelation, it's out of Isaiah. And so, the heavens shall pass away. Wow. The day of the Lord closes at the end of the millennium with the destruction of the heavens and the earth. It's not just you and I. It's not just the earth that's redeemed. There's a new heavens and a new earth. Wow. With a great noise. And it's the, the word there is used like the swish of an arrow, the rush of wings, the splash of water. His, it's a subtle noise, if you will. And uh, the elements uh, are the build, basic building blocks, and they will, in effect, untie or become loosed, if you will. That's what that actually says in the Greek. Seeing that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness, he advocates. That's what we ought to be. Like Francis Schaeffer admonished, how then shall we live? It should ha we should have a response to all of this. The question you need to ask yourself, do the realities of all this impact our personal priorities? That's the challenge. Looking forward, hastening the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with a fervent heat. Looking forward and hastening. Did you know you can hasten the day of the Lord? That's what he's looking for and hastening unto the day. That's what the Lord's prayer is all about. 
When you pray, 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 yeah, praise the Lord's prayer. Thy kingdom come. There's probably not one Christian in ten that knows what he's really praying for. Because nine out of ten churches, I believe, that don't even teach of the millennium at all. You all can help bring in the fullness in Romans 11.25. I'll let you tr- figure that out and how you do that. And you can check the commentaries. It's in your notes. And we have the elements shall melt. The very mountains will be melting, we understand. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness, devoutly, devoutly to be wished, as, as Hamlet might say. A new heavens and a new earth. Some people call it world number three. Some people feel this whole world is the second one after the interval between the first two verses of Genesis, but that's a whole other thing. This one, the one that's coming, will have righteousness dwelling in it. That is indeed devoutly to be wished. God dynamically sustains the universe, including the very atoms themselves. Atoms, it seems, are stable only because force and energy are being supplied into their nuclear uh, uh, binding fields from outside the system. And that's a surprising discovery in in, uh, uh, particle physics. You can find the discussions of that in our briefing pack on Beyond Perception to get into all of that if you want to get into that. And uh, see, God is the sustainer of the universe. He didn't only, not only did he create it, he's sustaining it. He is not uninvolved, remote, or detached, or impersonal, leaving things to run themselves. Not at all. He's very much involved. He energizes all things according to the counsel of his will. It's the first chapter of Ephesians. Nails that. We know he, he knows the number of hairs on your head, do you? We know we do that as a figure of speech. No, he does. Every time I take a shower, I look down there and realize he had to revise his inventory a little bit, yeah. <laughs> he cares about the sparrow that falls to the ground. The widow, the orphan, and the homeless. You. He cares more about you and me than we have the capacity to imagine. That's probably the staggering thing. That is probably the most essential thing for us to understand is how much he loves us. The extremes he has gone to for each one of us. Each one of us sitting in this room or watching this this thing is uh, God cares more about that than you and I can imagine. And God does not lose track of his children, but watches them with an infinite, patient, intimate, precise, fatherly care. He also intervenes. That's the other surprising thing. God intervenes in history from time to time to alter the status quo in response to prayer and even alters the course of entire nations. He moved the entire world into a census to get Mary and Joseph to move 30 miles. It's amazing what he does to get, how far he will go to get what he wants done. Now let's get back to our page se- text here in uh, Colossians 1. And he is the head of the body of the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn of the dead, that in all things he might have preeminence. He, who is the beginning. He's the originator. The Alpha and the Omega, the Aleph and the Tau. It's interesting to discover that there are untranslated letters in Genesis chapter 1. In Zechariah chapter 12, they shall look upon me whom they've pierced. But after me, there's two little letters, an aleph and a tau. Now, if they have a makef that's hooked, that's to indicate a direct, it's one of four things to to indicate a direct object. When they're floating like that, they're untranslated. They shall look upon me, the aleph and the tau. See, if you do it in the Greek, it it rings better to us, right? They look upon me, the alpha and the omega, whom they pierced. In the beginning, God the Aleph and the Tau created the heavens and the earth. Interesting. Many people miss that first because of some misguidance on the grammar. As the body of Christ, that is not the body of Christians, the body of Christ. The church is not merely a society, but is defined in terms of its organic communion with Christ. As we talk about doctrines, the only critical doctrine is a person, not a movement, not a... a a society, not a group of rules. No, it's a person. That's what we're all about. Our organic communion with that person. 
and that in all things he might have the preeminence. Proteo, the, used elsewhere in the New Testament. That's the very theme of, of Paul's epistle to the Colossians. For it pleased the Father that in him should all, all fullness, all fullness dwell? What on earth does that mean? Pleroma, the sum total of all the divine power and attributes. And that's, of course, a fam- it was a favorite term of the Gnostics, and that's what, what Paul is really writing against them. For in him all the fullness was pleased to dwell. God the Father was in him, in a sense. God the Holy Spirit was in his full measure. And uh, so, and dwell actually means to reside, to be at home permanently, if you will. And uh, the verb indicates that the fullness was not something added to his being that was not natural to him, but it was part of his essential being as part of his very constitution and that permanently. And that's Kenneth Wiest in his, his uh, commentary on this. What does that really mean? God is fully, it's not only manifest, he is fully manifest in him, is what that really means. In him should all the fullness dwell. Now that's one of the errors, we've been talking about the Trinity, the Jehovah's Witnesses are, uh, that's one of the things they attack. Every cult group attacks either Christ's humanity or his deity. The Jehovah's Witnesses try to attack the Trinity. And what you do with them, you jot down, you make, you, you jot down these verses, you take them to Isaiah 41.4, where God speaks of himself as the first and the last. You say, who is that? And they'll say, well, that's Jehovah God. Okay. Go to Isaiah 44.6, and say, I'm the first and the last. Who is that? Well, that's the whole, what they call Jehovah God. Okay. 48.12, same thing. Okay. Then you take them to Revelation 1.8, verse 11, verse 17. Each one it speaks of, I am the first and the last. Well, that's Jehovah God. And when, they, when you've got them almost tediously with those seven examples, you take him to Revelation 2.8. I am he, the first and the last, who was dead, was dead and now alive. And they stumble. Because that's clearly not the Father, that's the Son. And it punctures their little premises, if you will. The error of another Jesus. The Jehovah's Witnesses denial his deity. The Gnostics denial his humanity. The Universalists denial his sufficiency. And the sufficiency of Christ is the real issue before us with, and leaves us without excuse. And so, Socrates said to Plato, I think in 500 BC roughly, Socrates had an insight that's very profound. He said, it may be that deity can forgive sins, but I do not see how. He had enough perception to realize that if God is righteous, that how, how can he forgive sins? He's either got to, con- he's got to compromise his righteousness or not forgive sin. In other words, there was, a, there was a fundamental paradox there that he perceived. He didn't understand the answer. And we're going to explore the drama that comes from that tension in the next session. We're going to, in the next session, we're going to talk about what I call the ultimate drama. A drama the likes of which you cannot find any parallel to it. You may know enough about writing to know that a plot is typically a problem and its solution. The plot of any drama involves some, pro- some problem that shows up somewhere along the way and its solution. That's, that's what we call a plot. And we're going to see, in our next session, we're going to explore the most astonishing drama in the universe. And that's our thing next time. So let's bow our hearts for a word, word of prayer. Father, we stagger as we begin to get a glimpse of how much you love us and the extremes that you've gone to on our behalf. Father, we solicit from you, from your word and from your spirit, to help us grasp and appropriate, understand how far you've gone for us. Help us, Father, through your Spirit and through your Word to be more responsive to what you would have of us in response to these things as we commit ourselves 
with no qualifications or reservations whatsoever, we commit ourselves into your hands in the name of Yeshua, our precious Redeemer, our kinsman Redeemer, our Lord, our Savior. Indeed. Amen. Amen.